hold on, let me actually get in front of the mic. Yeah. I was looking through the stuff that you'd added onto the um, whiteboard discussion thing. Yeah. I bet we don't even get through the first one. <laughs> I'll, I'll put money on it now. So how are you? Uh, I'm well, thank you. How are you? Yeah, very well. Um, Good week. It's been a bit of a crazy kind of couple of weeks, really. One thing that I forgot to mention last time was that it was a big birthday for Mrs. Mack. Congratulations and happy birthday to her. Was it Was it one that ends in O? It was, yeah. It, it was an... Or, or one that ends in O. Uh, well, no, well, it was just an O. And okay. I, uh, you might have seen on Instagram, I've been build, building this mahogany and tulip wood dressing table organiser thing for her. Yeah, you, you, you can tell it's special. <laughs> you can tell it's not a job, can't you? <laughs> yeah. So I'd, I'd been building that over the last couple of weeks in between other jobs and stuff, and I didn't really want to talk about it last time because uh, she was in the house when we were recording. I didn't want to hear about it. I didn't want to spoil the surprise and all that. But it's all done now, and she's got it, and she's happy. You know what it is? It's lovely just every now and then getting to work on a little project like that and mm. because it's so far removed from what we do on a daily basis yeah tell me about it um knocking together big mdf units and all that sort of thing yeah and the thing is that i find when i'm making a little project like that i really want no distractions i want to set aside some nice quiet time with just some podcasts playing or music playing or whatever and i just want to enjoy it do some proper woodwork you know do some proper stuff where you can really take time over every part of it and over all the the joints and the finish and you know I could never have done a a project like that for a customer really for it to be um, a a practical thing for someone to buy because it took best part of of two weeks to build yeah would be a bit pricey wouldn't it it would yeah Uh, you know one of those days maybe (laughs) maybe one day one day and one thing I forgot to ask Last time you were away on holiday, how was your holiday? Yeah, we had a quick week away. Yeah, we, uh, it was lovely. Thank you. We we went to uh, to Italy to Venice. Uh, we we go uh, ra- around Easter every year, so uh, uh, it was very nice. Thank you. It was it was cold and wet initially, uh, and we just we've been going to Venice every year for about thirty years, and we've never seen the Aqua Alta, the high water, uh, mostly because of the time of year we've been. Uh, and as we arrived, it was it was happening. And we still missed it because it was all the, the the high water was happening at at midnight and the the wee small hours of the morning. So by the time the the tides turned around lunchtime, it wasn't so high. Um, but it, it was it was definitely well up. Uh, so yeah, it was it was lovely. But yeah, cold and wet when we arrived and uh, slowly improved, got a bit brighter, but it was still pretty cold and wet. We had a lovely time there. Thank you. Oh, fantastic, fantastic. Well. I have to say the cold and wetness is starting to grate on us a little bit here. I don't know what it's like down there, it's, but it's it's dank and claggy. I think is the perfect expression for it. It's just sort of that damp, grey, nothingy kind of weather. Um, part of this big job I've been doing, uh, I, I don't know if I mentioned it, but I'm doing a bit of painting for the family as well. They asked me to do it, and you know, I'm not a painter, I'm not a decorator, but yeah, you know, I, I I do a bit. Here and there, if it's part of a bigger job, one of the things they added on was a bathroom, and it's in a really dark, sort of almost black, purpley aubergine sort of colour. Uh, and the one day that I was doing it, the sun was streaming in through the through a south facing window, so you got the sun all day. It was swelteringly hot. One wall that was hitting the sun looked incredibly patchy because it was really brightly lit. And the other wall, because it was right against the window, looked almost black. I couldn't see what I was doing at all. And then the, the other few days, it was so dark, I could barely see what I was doing. So, yeah, it's, it's you know, we're, we're ready for a bit of warmer weather and a bit of brighter weather, I think. Oh, we? tell me a bit. I mean, I know us Brits, we like to whinge about the weather a bit, but this winter really has dragged on. It just feels like it's been a six-month winter. It really does. I'm very jealous of your spraying machine. Uh, yeah, I've been putting a few snaps on Instagram of uh, of um, my little Graco, uh, the results from my little Graco sprayer, uh, which is excellent. It's a, it's a little Graco Ultramax, um, and it's a small cordless airless sprayer. Uh, so instead of vaporizing the paint with air, it sort of it pumps it out basically through a fine nozzle, through a tip. Uh, and they're very simple to use. They're, you know, you don't have much in the way of control over it. You can change the size of the tip and you can change the pressure that the pump works at. 
and that's sort of it really you put paint in it you squeeze the air out and you start spraying it is you know staggeringly messy but the quality of finish you can get from it is incredible absolutely outstanding and and maybe that's just spraying generally because i'm not used to it you know I, i am a total novice at this um, but the quality that I've been getting from it is is really excellent and so quick, oh, so fast to use. The pictures that I saw on Instagram looked amazing. You know, of uh, I think I saw that like the ceiling that you'd done and the like the mouldings and and stuff just looked like they took the paint beautifully. And that's just normal paint. Didn't they? You don't have to thin it down or anything. No, that's that's straight out of the can, fire on ball estate emulsion. No thinning, no viscosity cups or any of that sort of stuff. So, Peter, is this the uh, death of the roller then for you? Ah, uh, no, it's it's too messy. Unless I can carve a little corner of space out somewhere. Where where the the building where I have my workshop, I've I've got some storage space there, some extra storage for these bigger units. And I think I found somebody to spray the big one, by the way, uh, which is good news. Met a couple of guys yesterday, actually. Who uh, are take? There are some shutters in the in in this house, and they're taking those away to be sprayed. Uh, and I think they're going to be able to do the uh, do the big sort of bunkette unit for me, where I've got this bit of storage to to store these bigger pieces. There, there's another part of the room that just looks like it's full of junk. Maybe it's really important to somebody, but I think well, if I could just clear some of that away, just carve out a little you know a little corner space i don't have to be there permanently that'd be perfect just for, for doing a little bit of spray again so i'll when i see the uh, the building manager i'll uh, i'll broach the idea i suspect it'll uh, fall on deaf ears but uh, we'll see i think generally as fine a finish as you can get from spraying it's too much effort to do it in the workshop it turns the workshop into a spray booth, basically, so uh, everything gets a fine dusting of whatever colour you you happen to be using. I'm using some Benjamin Moore paints. They're an, an American paint maker, and they do a high gloss, which is uh, 85% sheen, I think, and uh, I've just put a third coat on something as a, as a sample, and it looks absolutely fantastic. But it's a it's a sixteen hour drying time. Was oh, it like oil based then? What? Yeah, it, it's a water based paint, but with, you know, none of the benefits of being water based, other than being water based. Oh wow! Uh, but with a long, slow drying time, so that the paint really gets a chance to sort of flatten out. So yeah, we'll we'll I mean, great range of colours. We'll see how practical approach uh, an approach this is when I come to doing the whole room in green gloss, including the cabinetry and the walls. So, uh, yeah, we'll see. It's very green. It's very green. Or turquoise, kind of turquoise It's hard to say on uh, Instagram. I think the quote was, it'll it'll be like being inside an emerald, was the quote from the interior designer. So, you know, yeah, okay. So this is an interior design <laughs> room then, a professionally designed room? Yeah, the whole, the whole job is. Wow. I'm looking forward to seeing some pictures when it's all done. Yes, well, fingers crossed. I, I, as I've said many times, uh, uh, I don't think I'm going to be shooting any in this store just because pressure of, of time. But hopefully, I'll get a few, a few snaps of the job when it's done. It'll be a great portfolio one. Yes, it would. It would. Uh, but you know, it's it's a job like any other, and uh, the job's got to come first, doesn't it? Yeah. Well, I, I find that on a on a lot of jobs, especially at the minute, things are are so busy at the minute, and it, and I'm not too bothered because I've got quite a big backlog of stuff already filmed anyway. Yes. So for the jobs that I've got at the minute, I'm quite happy to just plough on and kind of catch up a little bit. I feel like I need to get these couple of jobs that I've got in done because, I mean, I'm starting a job on Monday yeah. and I haven't bought the materials or anything. At some point today, I need to buy the materials, get them back to the workshop, and I've got one unit that I need to get built ready to install um, next week. And somehow I need to kind of make all that happen today along with getting tomorrow's video edited for the my Saturday morning video so it's going to be a bit of a, a kind of crazy day and I don't like it when things have become that kind of compacted if you if you know what I mean oh absolutely I that, that's the story of my life for the last six seven weeks and and the story of my life for the, for the coming six or seven weeks as well I think there's so. just no leeway for anything to go wrong no leeway at all I'm I'm you know in the workshop I'm, I'm because obviously I'm not staying to watch paint dry up in North London uh, I'm coming back and uh, 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 and putting in a sort of an afternoon and evening shift in the workshop uh, uh, and weekends as well because I've just got to got to get through the backlog of stuff. Uh, I, I'm on site now, so I'm sort of you know, it's it's definitely happening. I just need to make sure I've got everything ready to roll for the next phase. Have you had 
many inquiries over the last couple of weeks as well for new work. Uh, I haven't actually. No, I've got uh, I've got a couple of jobs that are pending. People know that I'm busy uh, on this. Actually, I say that I did have. Um, I was going to chat with you about this as a potential topic. It says I got a phone call from somebody uh, in the week who was one of these guys who I'd done a quote for before. It's from a, a, a street that I did. I used to do about 95% of my work in, in this particular street, two, two streets locally. You know, I'm, I'm known there and I get most of the jobs that I quote on. And this is one that I didn't get. It was a silly little, you know, bit of a front fence dividing party line between two terraced houses and a gate and something else and a, a few silly little odds and ends. Uh, and I did him a quote and I popped it through his letterbox and I never heard from him again. Yeah, It's one of those ones who, you know, they don't even acknowledge the kind of effort that you've, <laughs> you've put in towards putting it. So anyway, he comes on the phone. He says, oh, yeah, you did a quote for me before. And uh, what it is, he said, uh, I want a, a new front door and the glass panel above it with the numbers on. And I've got new door locks and new hinges and the door frame's a bit twisted. So you might need to sort that out. But I just want labour only. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to provide all the materials. Uh, and I just said no, partly because there was a bit of history there, because, you know, I remember you, mate, uh, and partly because I just don't do that. I don't do labour-only quotes, simply because it's not worth the hassle. You know, either the materials won't be up to spec, you know, or, or, or they're shoddy or faulty. Who deals with the problem if a problem arises from a lock that I fitted but he bought you know I, so I just said no and he, he seemed quite surprised at that and I was going to ask you know do you, do you ever get involved in labour only quotes? In that situation yeah I think you're absolutely right to walk away from it I think when people start getting that picky about just the cost of the materials then what are they going to be like about the cost of the labour you know and, and exactly and if they want to save you know what what would they save? A hundred quid, two hundred quid? I, I don't know. They're not going to save a huge amount by getting the materials themselves. I, I pass any any trade discounts. I get, I pass them on because you know I'm I'm only ever buying materials on the clock. Effectively, I, I allow for my my time when I'm picking up materials and whatever else. So if I get any discount on it, then I I, I only charge those things on at cost. I don't uh, I don't add a margin onto that. Well, the, the way I tend um, to do it with materials is that I normally add on about 20%, but I don't charge my time for picking them up effectively. So Yeah, that, that's the other way of doing it. And it swings around a bit. It depends on the job. If it's a job where I'm going out mid-job to pick materials up, then obviously it's just on the clock, and then generally I'll charge the materials at, at cost or whatever. Yeah. It swings and roundabouts. You know, you've got to cover your time for actually going to pick the stuff up somehow. Absolutely. Whether it's by adding a margin on or, or by just covering it at your your normal rates or whatever. But yeah, I, I'm the same. I think the only exception really for me is doors. If I'm fitting doors, I always get the customer to buy the doors so that they're there ready on site when, when I get to site. Right. Mainly because I don't want the responsibility of having to ship around expensive doors that might get damaged while they're getting gotcha. shipped. Yeah. So I'd rather... And and plus you get problems where they arrive damaged and stuff like that. And to be honest, I don't do a lot of door fitting. I used to do quite a lot of, of door fitting and stuff like that. I don't do a lot yeah. of it now. Yeah, it's one of those jobs that sort of falls by the wayside when you get busier doing other things, isn't it? It is, yeah. You know, there's not a huge amount of money in it and it's it's a tricky job and it's a, it's a job where if something goes wrong, it can be quite a, an expensive mistake, you know. So Yeah, absolutely. Especially if you're working with like, glazed solid oak doors and, and things like that. Don't get us wrong, it's good bread and butter work and I'll do it if I've got a bit of a gap between the cabinet mating type work but I'd rather kind of avoid it. As I say, it's just, you know, some of these doors it can be 200 quid a door. It takes just a slip with a router or a slip with a chisel and... The risk-reward yeah. ratio is skewed way over towards the risk side, isn't it, When a, on doors? Even just cutting, cut, you know, if it's a front door... You know, cutting the locks out, cutting the, the letter plate holes out, all that sort of stuff. You've got to do it tidily. Absolutely. And you're, you're in a, invariably swinging a big heavy door around uh, in, a, in a, the most inconvenient of spaces. Uh, it's, it's no fun, that's for sure. No, no. So I generally say to customers, if, if it's a door job, you get them in and, and I'll fit them. But uh, other than that, no, I supply everything. Can't really think of anything that I would get the customer to, to buy direct. As I say, it would only really be high risk, high value stuff where I would maybe get the customer to buy stuff in, but I, I 
can't think of many examples of that, to be honest. Or, or where there's an aesthetic decision to be made as well. Like yeah. you want a particular bronze or brass letter plate or antique, something or other. It's far better that they get that themselves than... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> than you be their personal shopper, you know. Even with things like uh, handles and stuff like that, that can be quite a personal choice. I find most people just find something on Pinterest or Instagram and they're like, oh, well, can you find us something like this? They very rarely know where to actually go to buy them and they don't want to know how where to go to buy them, if that makes sense. Most of them would prefer to keep quite detached from that side of things. Um, they've got an idea of what it looks like. Um, I go off and I know where to generally find that sort of stuff. And uh, talking of which, I think Iron Mungry Direct are going to be ringing the doorbell in about half an hour. Ah, good. Yes, they're coming to me on Monday as well. <laughs> uh, according to the many, many notifications that they send out, which I'm not complaining about. but <laughs> Yeah, they, 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 they do like an email, don't they? Um, uh, we've started, haven't we? I had, a, I had, I had some follow-up from uh, episode four. I think we talked about ratings and reviews. I think I said that iTunes was the only place you could uh, you could do ratings and reviews for the podcast. Uh, it turns out you can actually rate and review on Stitcher as well. All ah, right. Uh, so my apologies to Stitcher for not uh, for uh, for not mentioning them. You've been a busy boy doing time and motion studies on your uh, floating shelves. Oh I, my I goodness me! Do you want to go into that now? Yeah, go on. My spreadsheet has grown into quite into quite a behemoth. It's to the point now that the font size is so small I'm actually um, <laughs> struggling to read it. And I've, I've deliberately not sent you this spreadsheet because I figured if I can't explain it to you over a podcast mm. without actually showing you the physical spreadsheet, yeah. then there's no point in us talking about it on the podcast. Yeah, okay. Because no one else is going to see the spreadsheet to go with it. Yeah, um, true. So yeah, I, mean, yeah. I, I might really go into the detail of this on my Patreon at some point. I don't know if my Patreon even care about this sort of stuff, but mm. I might keep that as a, a thing that I might do on the back end and go through the absolute minutiae of pricing up floating shelf jobs. I was going to say, so on the on the back end of our discussions about pricing and rates and all that sort of stuff, you decided to do a, a sort of an in-depth analysis of exactly how long it took you and and. Every, all the costs involved in a, a floating shelf job. That's right. I mean, from my perspective, you know, you get your bread and butter jobs, of jobs that you're probably yep. always going to have to do and you always will have to do and you've always done them and they're proper joinery jobs, but they're relatively predictable. Uh -huh. Your bread and butter jobs. And for me, it's floating shelves. I do a lot of floating shelves in between doing other kind of built-ins and alcove units and all that sort of thing. Right. Uh, and I quite enjoy, and the thing is, and you're always going to have to do floating shelves generally as part of doing alcove units because you'll often have situations where you've got a lower unit and then floating shelves above it. Yep. Or a lower unit and then an upper unit above it. That tends yep. to be your two two options. And I would say it's about 50-50 whether or not people choose to have a full built-in upper unit or whether they just want to go for kind of slightly more minimalist, sleek floating shelves above it. Yep. So the nice thing about floating shelves is that, as I say, they're relatively predictable. So I was on a job a couple of weeks ago and it was a model floating shelf job. Everything was set up perfectly for this job. It was in a new build. The walls were relatively square. I had plenty of room to work. That's I was a left first. To, to, Goodness me. Yeah, it, it was like everything about this job was was kind of as perfect as you can get a job to be, other than actually doing them in your own workshop. Yeah. So I thought, you know, I'm going to use this as a... And I've, I've kind of done a, a bit of time and motion on this sort of stuff before when I originally worked out how much should I charge per shelf for fitting floating shelves. Uh -huh. Because you've got to have a ballpark idea for this when, you, you know, a customer's going to come and say, well, I want two shelves. What if I want 10 shelves? And you need to be able to, like, come up with some sort of pricing model for that. So I already had a rough idea of, of what I should be charging, but I'd never gone into it in that much detail. I'd never really gone into it to the point of pricing up every single bit of material that's involved in the job. Yeah. And um, I'd never kept that close a track of the labour. I think all I'd done was... Yeah, I can maybe get 
eight done or ten done in a day, let's just divide that up or, or whatever. But even that, you see, that doesn't work because then you would be saying, oh, well, I'm going to do them for like 30 quid a shelf, which yeah, is... No, like- so I, I, I reckon on about six in a day. I haven't done floating shelves for a while, I've got to admit, but uh, I reckon on six in a day in in the sort of properties that I work in. So wonky walls, every everyone needs scribing in, all that sort of stuff. Exactly. And this is a, the stuff that you, you're going to have to take into account with this sort of Stuff. So I'll go through it as quick as I can possibly go through it so that it makes sense. I'll not go into the detail of every little bit of it, but hopefully this will kind of make sense. So before I start, I'll explain what I mean by a floating shelf and how I... How I okay, do I need to go to the bathroom first? Is it going to be that long? It might take a while. <laughs> <laughs> so when I do floating shelves, because I, everyone's got a different way of doing them, I think, but when I do floating shelves, I basically put in... Uh, framework and the framework I use custom ripped 20 mil um, bracing so I, I rip down all the bracing to 20 mil high and I find 20 mil is about the thinnest I can get away with for the for the bracing anything thinner than that you're running the risk of the, the screws maybe splitting the timbers or you're just going to run into problems basically anything fatter than that means that your overall shelf thickness is going to get really thick you know so with this uh using a 20 mil bracing means that the the overall shelf width is about 45 mil thick i put the bracing the batten around the alcove uh, and across the front face yeah and then you skin this top and bottom with a with something that's right so i skin the top and bottom so the top generally gets 18 mil or three quarter inch ply if if i can get good enough finished grade ply. All oh, right, okay. Um, I just find that ply is more rigid than MDF and less susceptible to sagging over time. It's really the only time that I, I tend to use ply, to be honest. Um, but I just find that in, in the kind of sandwich construction, the way that I make these, they're really, really rigid at the end of it. And sometimes, if you've, especially if people are storing things like vinyl and really heavy stuff, um, you do have to make sure that they're, they're properly reinforced so that they're not going to start sagging over time. When, when you get a top and bottom skin on there, the actual glue area is very large. So for it to sag, for it to actually break down, the, the, amount, the, the length of the glue joint that would have to fail is, is pretty big. Exactly. And this, this is the key thing, is that when you do a kind of sandwich construction like this of plywood on the top, softwood um, framework in the middle and then I use an MDF 6mm MDF on the bottom mm-hmm. um, and that gives a overall I think it comes out at 44 but once you take into account you know the thickness of the glue and all that you might as well say it's about it's about 45 mil yeah and then I put a fascia strip on the front to cover a, the the front fascia and that is always custom ripped to the exact size because yep. not all MDFs are, are the same. They say they're 18 mil. You go around them with some verniers and, and check them because yeah. they are very rarely even close to 18 mil. You know, I've seen many different MDFs be closer to 19 mil. So it depends on the MDF you're going yeah. for and you can easily run past that kind of 44 mil mark so you, you end up having to custom rip the front mm-hmm. fascia but yeah when you've glued it together in a sandwich like that and and i clamp it and then i use a nail gun to just nail it together which holds it while the glue's yeah. drying and once that glue's dried it's effectively a 45 mil thick block of wood that you've got at the front there and it acts like a 45 mil thick block of wood even though it's only a, a tiny little supporting piece even though the the bracing at the front is only 20 by 18 that adds an enormous amount of strength to the front. And the back is obviously braced on the wall anyway, so the back can't can't yeah. bend down. How, how thick is your capping piece at the front? Uh, 18 mil normally. 18 mil, right, okay. Sometimes yeah. I'll just use like a 10 or 8 or 10 mil capping piece for the front, but it just depends what I've got in stock, basically. It, it It's purely a decorative thing at the end of the day. The nice thing about a thinner capping strip is that it's easier to plane down yeah. if you do have it a little bit too big and you want to get it to the to the exact dimensions of the of the shelf it makes it a little bit easier so yeah that's how i'm making the shelf so effectively plywood top if possible if i can't get decent ply it'll be 18 mil mdf top but if i can get good quality paint grade ply for the top um then then great so i've based it on that uh, and and i've based it on an assumption that a floating shelf's probably going to be about a foot deep uh-huh. they're, they're normally about 30 centimeters Deep. Yeah. On a bad day, it's uh, 
30 centimetres on the left-hand side and 28 on the right. But yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and 32 in the middle. You know. Oh, yeah, I've been there. Yeah, absolutely. Or just weird angles all the way around. Actually, I did a tips video about... Um, yes, I saw that. Uh, ...scribing saw that. out angles in, in a very... And that was in a, a new build home as well. And the angles in this alcove were unbelievable. Anyway, and the only thing you could do for that is literally make a template for every single individual shelf. Uh, anyway, so I've worked it out that if you are making a shelf that is a foot deep, mm -hmm. then you're going to be able to get hopefully eight of them out of one sheet of eight by four. Yep. Assuming that it's not any wider than 1220 wide or, or four foot wide. Mm. If if it breaches the four foot wide mark, then you're going to be reduced to a maximum of four out of a single sheet. Yeah. So you've straight away, as soon as you've made a shelf that's over four foot wide, you can no longer run them down the sheet of of uh, eight before that you're making them out of. You're going to have to run them across the sheet and you've halved the number of shelves that you can get out of your, yeah. your sheet of wood. So your costs are going to have to probably reflect that. Yeah, absolutely. At what point do you start thinking about adding bracing? How how wide would you go before you start thinking about putting a piece of uh, steel angle or, or aluminium or whatever in there? Well, I've done floating shelves with this technique that I'm using up to about 1.8 metres, coming up for two metres. Wow. And I'm getting zero sag on them. Now, don't get us wrong. The the really long ones that I've done have been mainly for things like shoe storage and, and stuff yeah. like that, which are generally very light. If someone said that they want to store their entire vinyl collection on a two meter wide floating shelf, yeah. I would have to include some sort of um, metal bracing inside yeah, it. Yeah, like, yeah. As you say, like a, an L angle or yeah. uh, it would have to have something inside it. I, I would say... It just depends on the weight of what's going on. Sure. The heavier thing that I can think off the top of my head that commonly goes on floating shelves is vinyl. Yeah. Um, but you get some people with like really, really giant books as well. Yeah, yeah. And and then the other thing to consider is maybe just putting in some supports between the shelves just to try and spread that load a little bit mm -hmm. if that is an option and split the shelves up because you do find, especially with MDF over time, it can just very, very slowly sag. Ply seems to be a bit more resilient to to the sagging. But even in the sandwich kind of technique, like what I'm talking about, really heavy stuff, it will sag over time. But, you know, I've been in stately homes where they've got bookcases that are 300 years old, 400 years old, and and those have sagged, you know, and <laughs> those are made of solid oak. Oh, that's MDF for you, you know, three and three, four hundred years, and that's that's yeah, you know, the most you'd expect from it. You know? Well, is that unreasonable? <laughs> <laughs> but you know, wood will sag. Any wood will sag if you leave a heavy enough weight on it for a long period of time. Of course, it will. You've got to get a balance there. I'm not going to start making my floating shelves out of solid, um, solid oak. No, indeed. So anyway, you can, uh, so yeah, fourteen, twelve, twenty, four foot. Then you've got to turn anything over that. You've got to turn the sheet the other way around, so you're going to get fewer shells from a sheet. So that affects the cost. Yes, yeah. let's work it on worst case scenario. So I've gone into working out. Okay, I need the bracing timber to go round and make the framing. I need the fascia timber to go on the front. I need obviously the ply for the top, the MDF, the six mil MDF for the bottom. I use angle brackets to hold the front frame on, so the twenty mil frame at the front of the shelf just gets held temporarily with angle brackets. Those don't really do anything other than just temporarily hold it in place until you've got the thing glued up. It doesn't do anything structural. And then I've got, obviously, the screws for screwing it all together, the uh -huh. plugs for plugging it in the, in the wall, and obviously yep. if it's going onto a plasterboard wall, I generally use expanding metal plugs, and they can be quite expensive. You've got your consumables, your nails, your glue, sandpapers, toolware, and all that sort of thing. Yep. So I've broken it down and I've worked out that the material costs coming out at about six, £17 per shelf, which is interesting because you can buy an IKEA lac shelf for £10, I think. Uh -huh. So so there you go. There's your material. That's the absolute cheapest that I can buy the materials just to make it up per shelf. It's about £17 per shelf. And then on this model install job, I managed to fit a shelf. Oh, well, I fit two shelves in uh what was it 150 minutes altogether so it worked out at about one and a quarter hours per shelf yeah so again i came back to my hourly rate thing which i as i say i don't generally quote to customers but it's handy to have at the back of my mind so if i'm working on 40 pounds an hour 
there's one and a quarter hours, there's 50 pounds labor per shelf. So we're now at 50 pounds plus a 17, so there's 67 pounds per shelf. Now that's completely unfinished, not painted or anything. So then on the painting side, I found that to paint a single floating shelf takes me about 15 minutes to paint uh, for one coat of paint. Yeah. Obviously, it can save a bit of time if you can get all your undercoating done in the workshop beforehand. But but it still needs if, doing. If, you know, it's still got to be done. Whether there, there are plenty of situations where that's just not practical for whatever reason, whether it's time constraints or practical constraints, you, pro, you there are many situations where you're going to have to do all the painting, including the undercoating on site. And I don't know about yourself. I always allow for three coats of paint, so that's forty five minutes painting time, not including drying time. Mm-hmm. So again, if I work that back to the hourly rate, it's basically £10 per shelf per coat of paint. And then I'm going to add on just two quid for paint per coat. So let's say £12. So what we what were we up to? Were we up to £67? 67, pounds? 67 yeah. So we're now up to £79, and that's only having it with one coat of paint. So you, you, you need three coats of paint. So... 18, it says 9103 pounds, I think we're up to per shelf, fully finished. So there's your ballpark. Almost best case scenario, if you're working it back to your hourly rate, if you're doing floating shelves fully finished, you need to be charging about 100 pounds per shelf. And, and, and what do you charge, Andy, for... <laughs> <laughs> or is that too too leading a question for you? I'd ballparked it at about seventy pounds per shelf, but generally I don't do the finishing. It's very rare that I paint the shelves. Normally, it's it's unfinished. Okay. And to be honest, that's in the ballpark. It's I should be charging about sixty seven pound per shelf, mm. and I was charging about seventy. That was about the the figure that I'd come up with. But what I wasn't doing is charging a hundred, hundred and five pounds per shelf fully finished. I was probably charging maybe eighty or ninety pounds per shelf f- fully finished. So I've definitely not been charging enough when I've been doing all of the painting. Do you charge more if it's a one-off and reduce the rate if if there are more shelves going in the alcove? Well, this is where it then starts to get really complicated because okay, what happens when your hourly rate breaches your daily rate? So I've worked that out on my spreadsheet. So I've found that at one and a quarter hours per shelf, the most shelves you can possibly fit in a day is, what did you say? In the same alcove. So obviously each one's scribed in, but essentially similar sizes. I reckon about the the most I can do is six. In fact, I've done six in a day. You're, You're spot on, Peter. Spot on. Six, six to seven, well, I've worked out six would take seven and a half hours. And when you do that, do you know, do you know the trick to getting them uh, up quicker? Go on. You, you put the, it goes against every grain of common sense, but you put the bottom one in first, level and true, and then you, and then you cut spaces out of scrap MDF and you bear off the bottom one to put your battens in. I think I see what you mean. Explain that again. So, so you put the bottom shelf in, yeah, yeah, the, the lowest shelf, whichever it is, yeah, yeah, uh, and then you make you because you've already oh, worked out, you right, you've worked right, out where right, the yes. shelves are going. You've just cut spaces out of scrap MDF or plywood or whatever else, and then you use the bottom shelf as your datum, uh, and then you put the other shelves off your spacer, so you're not leveling each one up every time. Oh, you've you've changed the process. Uh, sorry. Yeah, you have to go back to back to your spreadsheet now. Rework that out. I ha- I need to do a whole new <laughs> spreadsheet. Because I I do it on I fit all the bracing uh-huh. first, so obviously I've had to go around and do spirit level round and, yeah. and. Well, I mean that would work. Just bear in mind that you to allow for the thickness of your uh, of your cladding. Otherwise, you you get shelves that get you know yeah. narrower the higher up you go or, or wider, yeah. whichever it is. And I also always carry around a spacer block when I'm showing the customer because sometimes they'll ask for floating shelves to be quite close together and I can't physically get the nail gun in. Mm-hmm. And if I can't get the nail gun in between the shelves, that causes a big problem. <laughs> so It does. So I always carry this little spacer block around with us and I say... That's the narrowest you can go. Shelves yeah. can't yeah. be any... You can't, they can't be any closer together than that, otherwise I can't get the physically get the nail gun in be- between the shelves. Uh, little little spreader clamps are really handy in, in that situation. Yeah. I'll tell you what I do normally do is that I'll scribe the underside of a shelf because it's much easier to scribe the 6mm MDF than it is to scribe the, the plywood on, on the top. So I'll use the 6mm the as the template. 
Yep. And then I'll use that as a template for cutting the top. And and generally, it's not going to be far off all the way up the alcove, you know. I mean, it will be wildly out unless you're in a new build. And even in a new build, it can be wildly out. But once you've got it scribed for one, generally it's yep. going to be pretty close for, for all of them. And another little tip as well is that you can undercut on your top shelf yeah. um, or do a back cut. So basically when you're cutting it, do a, a slight angle on the cut. Yeah, yeah. It, it just pedal. makes it much easier to plane it back to the to the exact shape of the alcove. But generally you're only going to have to do that if they're, if they're really wildly out, you know. So, yeah, six shelves per day, not including finishing. That That's just the fitting of the shelves. But once you get to that, you're breaching your day well i would be breaching my day rate because my day rate's 220 pounds a day but on my hourly rate i would be charging 300 pounds so, sounds like a good earner yeah so what i'm gonna have to say is from five shelves and above it's capped at 220 pounds a day otherwise you're suddenly into that realm where well i don't know i suppose could if if people are happy to just say no it's this price per shelf no matter what it does keep life very simple but you are going you are going well beyond your probably your, your day rate then exactly yeah. but you win some and you lose some and then on the if you're going for funny sh- fully finished shelves you're looking closer to four shelves per day especially if you take into account your yep. paint drying time yeah. and all that sort of thing and again you're going to breach your day rate much quicker you're going to breach your day rate within within four shelves i've found so i found that once i'd worked all that out i've then worked out a, a tapered cost per shelf uh-huh where it takes into account the day rate. Now, this is getting ridiculously complicated, and I don't advise anyone works it out to this degree. Uh, all I'm saying is is that I have worked it out to this degree, kind of a little bit for the podcast and a little bit just for my own peace of mind as well. Mm. But if we were working back from the £67 per shelf that we'd mentioned earlier from one shelf, yeah. well, once you get to five shelves, I should bring it down to about £60 per shelf. And once I get to six, I should bring it down to fifty-three pounds per shelf or fifty-four pounds per shelf, and that's for unfinished. Uh-huh. And if they're going to be fully finished for one shelf, I think we said of hundred and three pounds. Once you get to three shelves, I should be bringing that down to ninety-six pounds. And once you get up to four shelves, I should be bringing the cost per shelf down to seventy-seven pounds per shelf or seventy-eight pounds per shelf. And this is because of the tapering due to breaching what your day rate would be versus what your hourly yeah sure rate sure. is plus once once you're on site and you know doing the second third fourth shelf you get into the swing of it and you and you do get faster you know as, as you exactly but i did work out the timings based on a model floating shelf where i didn't have to do any i didn't have to do any scribing yeah yeah i yeah, didn't yeah. have to go up ladders i didn't have to uh work in an awkward space where i had to keep on going backwards and forwards to the truck to do all the cutting or whatever you know i could do everything on site and that saves a lot of time so yeah definitely you are going to get faster the more that you do but the trade-off is is that i've based these timings on almost a best case scenario it took for for two shelves it took 60 minutes to install the framework Mm. well okay let's work it on one shelf so it took half an hour to install the framework it took 15 minutes to cut the timber to the correct size for the tops and bottoms, and it took half an hour to install the timbers and do all the filling of nail holes and all that sort of thing. So there's your one and a quarter hours per shelf. And, you know, maybe you can shave a little bit off that, but you're not going to shave a huge amount off. So yeah, sure. there you go. That is my ridiculously anal breakdown of how much it costs to fit floating shelves. Mm, interesting. But the interesting thing about this, okay, <laughs> most people aren't going to go to this degree of yeah. working it out to this level we've established that we were both in the ballpark anyway which is fine but if this is how complicated it is just for floating shelves yeah no wonder people struggle properly pricing up doing bigger jobs yes and and i think this is one of the key things that i'm wanting to get out of this is that Sometimes you really are on a hiding to nothing trying to price stuff up to the nth degree. Yeah. For ev- even for your, your simplest of jobs, I've got a, a spreadsheet here in tiny, tiny font size to break it down to the prices that were talked about there. Imagine trying to do that as a for, for alcove units or for fitted wardrobes yeah. or, or whatever. Yeah. It just, it's, it, it is 
complicated. Yeah. It's hard to work these things out. And, and we've got a, a background, a history of doing this for a living for you know more than a few years. Somebody coming in all new and fresh and shiny would really struggle, I think, to, to come up with sensible costs. And, and uh, you know, I did a, a, a pricing, couple of pricing videos, pricing up a job videos on, on the channel, uh, on the YouTube. Uh, I've, I've had a few people say, who are in the business, and they say uh, in the comments, you know, I'm really struggling with the pricing. You say you, you quoted your day rate, but that's not what you take home. I mean, other than the cost of the materials, I can't think for the life of me what the other expenses are. So they've got no clue as to as to how much their business is costing them to run. You know, it's uh, it's tragic. Um, you can get yourself into a real mess that way. I mean, just to briefly, briefly go through it, because we could do a whole podcast just about breaking down the costs of running a joinery business. But you've got the the running costs of your vehicle, you've got insurance costs for your vehicle, you've got insurance costs for yourself, you've got your, your workshop costs, you've got heat, light and power for your workshop, everything. To running a workshop is incredibly expensive. Yep. You've got all your parking charges that we've talked about last time. Yep. You've got keeping your tools in order, you know. Okay, let's say you've got 10 grand's worth of tools mm -hmm. and let's take an average of a five-year lifespan per tool average, where there's two grand a year straight off. Yep. Straight off. And plenty of people have way more than 10 grand's worth of tools. And okay, you might get more than five years out of them, but I'm just saying, let's say, on average, you know, you, you drop tools, you break, you, especially screwdrivers and stuff, you, you, you damage and you drop them, there's 300 quid on a new screwdriver set or whatever, uh, like drill set. Repairs and renewals, uh, insurance, uh, cost of premises, obviously, you're, you're working from your garage, but if, you know, I've got rent and rates. Yeah, but there's still a cost, you know. The you know, we all, we all do this to try and improve our you know, financial well-being. Uh, so you've got to, you know, you've got to make a, a, a decent, turn a decent shilling for yourself as well. A lot of people forget that, you know, we, they start businesses to improve their lot to, to, to make a decent living. Uh, yeah, absolutely. And working from a garage is is great, but it's not sustainable long term. You know, at some point, you're going to have to build into your pricing that you need to get out of that garage and into a proper workshop, um, which has always been my plan. And I'm I'm still looking and I'm really struggling to find anywhere suitable long term. Um, and I, I, mm. I'm constantly looking, but there's just everything's either ridiculously big or ridiculously expensive and trying to find something yep. small and, you know, I don't even need running water. All I need is electricity and a small space and that'll do me. Yep. And it's, it's the classic conundrum. You want four, five, 600 square foot small with a reasonable ceiling height and good access. And they're like, they're like hen's teeth. They're, they're so rare. Exactly, uh, and exa and I'm not going to the hassle of moving f to then have to move again in a, in a year's time. If if I'm going to do it, it's going to be something pretty long term. I need to be viewing that I can stay there for at least five to ten years. I would have said, yeah. Um, so you've got to take into account all of that in your pricing, even if you don't have the costs yet. You you need to take into account that at some point you are going to have those costs. You you might not have a van yet, but at some point. You will need a. Yep, at some, some point, point you you'll will. need it. You've yeah. got to take that into account in your costs, and if you don't, it, it will absolutely come back and bite you. Absolutely, I've got a, a, a video plan. I, I might be able to do it this weekend to come out next week, on the just a, as a follow on from the original pricing ones about the cost of doing business, where I've got a spreadsheet and we you go in into detail about this. And the beauty of doing it on a spreadsheet is that you can then do all the what if calculations. So what if, you know. Uh, you, you have you don't have a, a, a workspace now, or you're working from home. But what if it's going to cost you, you know, five or six thousand pounds a year to rent somewhere, rent and rates or whatever? You can see that impact. You can see that effect uh, on your uh, on your bottom line very easily. And it's much better to do it on a spreadsheet than than to do it on a bank balance. Yeah, <laughs> I definitely. <found. laughs> I, I completely agree. I completely agree. Uh, fascinating. So let me tell you about my my floating shelves, what, what I do, because I, I looked into this a little bit as well. Um, uh, uh, similar kind of process. I actually use inch and a quarter planed softwood for the uh, batten, 
So it comes out about 28 mil thick. And I usually skin it in either 9 mil top and bottom or 12 at the top and 6 underneath. Now, these are for relatively narrow alcoves, yeah, floating shelves in alcoves. So Just, uh, tell us, uh, so the, what do you use for the button again? Uh, it's, it's inch and a quarter plain redwood, which comes out about 28 mil thick. And what do you have on the top? It's either 9 and 9 or more often 12 and 6 underneath. Oh, okay, yeah, okay. Yeah, I've d- I've done ones with twelve on the top. I think I have done some with nine on the top as well. But yeah, definitely twelve's twelve's definitely an option for the top. Yeah, uh, because it gets its strength from the from the battening because you've got a thicker batten, twenty eight mil, uh, and then you've got you know twelve mil top, which is easier to scribe, and a six mil underneath, which again nice and easy to scribe in. Um, and a very similar sort of technique to, to how you do yours, Andy. Screwed and plugged on three sides to the wall. The face piece just screwed in at either end into the ends of the side battens, if you see what I mean. Uh, and then the top. I, I don't actually pin them on the front edge. I put little pins in around the, uh, around the, the very back edge. And I've got some longer reach clamps that I just clamp the, uh, uh, the top and bottom skins on with because i just think of little kids or whatever i don't want any chance of having a a a pin or a nail head sticking out uh that i've that i've missed you know Uh, and then a front capping piece which is usually just six mil uh six mil mdf mdf just again just to 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 finish that front space off just to to hide the laminations Uh, uh, all glued up with 10 minute pva and yeah that's about it really so similar slightly different sort of approach uh, i do glue in uh, uh, either an aluminium or a, or a rolled steel piece of angle on on anything over uh about 900 mil actually i go i go for wider than that because um uh, and i glue that in with uh, a five minute uh pu adhesive uh, lum- lumberjack lumberjock can't remember which it, which it is the, the one that you get from tool station uh, a cartridge yeah so it goes in a sealant type gun that's really good really fast setting great stuff because it stays, it stays slightly flexible. So I, I started using epoxy, and that got a bit brittle. So as the shelf sagged, that the, the epoxy would let go. Uh, so I've started using this uh, PU adhesive, which is really good. Interesting. I, I use uh, just Type One Two for for the glue on all of it. Once it's clamped and uh, pinned, and the glue obviously once it's dried, and I just find that it's an incredibly rigid kind of structure in fact i've done some where they're like u-shaped where it goes all the way down the wall and then the back wall completely floating so no visible brackets at all Um, and i've done those where they're about 1.8 meters long and they've been absolutely just solid no uh, sagging at at all Uh, don't get us wrong i wouldn't want to sit on them mainly because it would probably just pull the wall away it would be the wall that would fail rather than the rather than the shelves but yeah interesting no it's it's always interesting to see other people's um approach to stuff but you're at the same thickness as as me aren't you where you're 46 yeah same thickness just doing it a slightly different way i have a slightly slightly thicker battening but a thinner skin because the strength comes from the batten then not the uh, uh, and the lamination we are talking about kind of pseudo floating shelves here where they are they are supported yeah so support uh, al- floating alco shelves so supported on three yeah. sides of it rather than true floating shelves yeah where it's uh, completely unsupported yeah, yeah, yeah. mimicking your yeah, ikea lac type shelves That's the one, yeah. and yeah. making your true floating shelves as we both know is a nightmare it is it is not a trivial task no it's not that is for sure uh, in terms of costs, I charge 150 quid for the first shelf, and then on a sliding scale, if it's the first shelf and one other, then it's about 120 quid for the second one, uh, uh, and then progressively less. But I never charge less than 80 for a shelf. Yeah, uh, and that's uh, that only comes down to that if you're getting half a dozen done. So interesting. So I mean, and I wouldn't generally go out and just do one shelf. So I would. I would never be in that position. It, it's it's happened to me early on in when I was doing bits and pieces, and I, I stuck a price in, and it seems to have seems to have stuck. Um, but I, but I haven't done a one off for a while now. I think that's perfectly reasonable, though. You know, at the end of the day, you've got to like kind of cover your time for getting there and and make the job worthwhile. And exactly, I don't think there's many jobs that you can do where you can charge less than 
well, up here maybe a hundred pounds, but certainly down there, I would say there can't be that many jobs where you can justify charging less than a hundred and fifty pound for the job um, to to actually make some sort of living out of it. But no, uh, that's right. But it's interesting when you take into account higher costs of London and and all that sort of thing. It's not far out from the the figures that I was saying, really. No, that's right. That's right. Yeah. We'll we'll do a one about. The actual alcove units at one point. <laughs> imagine how big that spreadsheet is going to be. My word. I would imagine that would be a little bit more complicated. I think it probably would be. What door design would you like? Do you want fully um, panelled doors? Or do oh, you want uh, shaker doors? Or do you want Shaker style panel doors, flush doors... Would you like the punched pattern, you know? Do you want fluted, do you want fluted uh, trims? and brass, fluted trim, fluted face frames, yeah, all that. Yeah, that's a, that's a minefield, isn't it? Interesting. Well, there you go. You know, okay, it's not the most interesting topic, but if you're getting into this world and you're going to have to think about what you need to charge customers, you've got to pick a starting point somewhere. And ultimately, you need to come up with some cost and then run it over a period of time and see what you're actually taking home because I guarantee it won't be a it'll be a fraction of your day rate will be your actual take home yep wage absolutely uh, it'll, it'll be absolutely. a fraction of it so please don't think that if you're charging 40 pound an hour that you're going to be bringing home 80 grand a year that that isn't the way it works unfortunately unfortunately sadly not I don't know if you saw on the podcast twitter we had a question from uh, somebody, sorry, if, uh, I haven't got a note of your name, do apologise, um, about uh, uh, the, they're starting to do little bits of video and they were asking about a, a clip-on lapel or lavalier Leva- microphone. Love mic, yeah. Love mics, yeah. Uh, I, I told the guy what I use, which is a, a cheap and cheerful sort of 15-quid uh, mic by Boya. It's a Boya BYM1, uh, which is fantastic, actually. It's uh, for, for the money and... Uh, you get a big long cable with it and it sounds great i've i've tried all kinds of under 10 quid ebay specials and they've all been horrible this is the first one i tried that actually sounds decent and it is battery powered uh, as well so uh, you don't have to rely on phantom power from the camera or, or any of that sort of stuff uh, and, and it's you know just just a really good little thing i don't use them very much um but i was curious uh, you as the audio expert as to as to what you use to record your uh record your, your, your videos? On. Um, well, I don't know about expert. I'm a bit out of date. But um, I use um, the mic. I've actually done a video about this on my channel about recording, trying to get decent quality audio while you're in the workshop because I see so many really good videos, but they're not sorting the audio out and you can't hear what yeah, people are saying. Yeah, by poor audio. Honestly, audio is a bigger thing that you need to sort out than the video quality. You can get away with Terrible video quality, but if your audio is not up to scratch, people will really turn off quite quickly. Um, yeah, every audio guy says that, just as an aside. Well, I yeah. know, true. <laughs> but, it, but it is true. But <laughs> you've got to get the mic as close to you as possible. That That is the yeah. fundamental thing. So if you're four or five foot away from the mic, anything beyond two or three foot away, you've got to really be thinking about getting to a lav mic. You know, you can use like the shotgun type mics, maybe if you're within two or three foot of the mic and road do some really nice ones. And it depends on the environment you're in, how echoey the environment is and stuff like that. I just yeah, it's find... worth, worth saying as well that uh, workshops are a particularly hostile environment for, for audio recording because they're you know, sharp, shiny walls, bouncing every, all echoey noise around. Uh, and then you can be talking to camera, doing a piece to camera, and then you fire up a saw and your levels go through the roof. So it's, you know, lots of challenges involved. Absolutely. And, and uh, the lav mic that I use is a, made by a company called Giant Squid Audio Oh yeah, and yeah. Uh, they're a company in America, and I've been using this right. for five or six years. It was only about forty dollars, but it's a great little lav mic, and I, I highly recommend it. I found it. Are you? You'll be familiar with Curtis Judd. Yes, I know Curtis. Yeah, yeah. So he did a review of this mic five or six years ago, and I was in the market for a lav mic, and and he did a quite a nice A B comparison between the Giant Squid one and I think a more expensive one I can't remember and it was like well that'll do the job that's great and um, as I say it came over from the states I can't remember whereabouts in the states it's only about $40 it's just a great little mic and it's been doing the job over the last five or or six years and uh, as I say I found it via 
Curtis is channeled. And uh, interestingly, they they used to be made out of sh- um, I, I don't know if it's uh, gun shells. The 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 actual body of the that's right. They were they were shotgun cartridges or something, weren't they? They were yeah. yeah. And I've got I've, my original one, which I've got on at the minute, is uh, it's like a nine millimeter cartridge or something <laughs> like that. And uh, and it wasn't until I read up about them that I read. It's like oh wow, Brilliant. it is as well. Apparently, the capsules were bought from in bulk from like Sennheiser or something, so they're quite good capsules. Right. Uh, although I don't think they're done like that anymore. No, maybe and not. The the yeah. back then they were getting individually handmade by this guy in America, and now it's all production line. It's turned into quite a big thing. But uh, yeah, and, and it's a dynamic mic. It doesn't need any power. It go, goes straight into my um, little Zoom portable recorder, and it does right. the job. Great, really quiet, no hiss, decent quality. Right. Um, just a, a mm. three and a half mil connector yeah. on it, and I, I just have it going into my little Zoom yeah. H1 recorder. Uh, so you record your audio separately as a separate track from your from your yeah. camera. I have tried doing it direct to the camera, and I've found that you end up having to have such a long cable. Unless you're using quite a thick, decent, expensive cable, which then becomes quite impractical, I find it picks up too much interference from lights and machines and stuff. Right, and and it just generally becomes a bit of a pain in the neck. So then you've you've the only alternative then is to go for wireless systems, and then that comes with a whole host of a whole other host problems. Of other, other issues, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah great. So okay. I, I find having this with the little Zoom H1, it just yeah. works great. I keep the recorder in my pocket. Um, the only thing I would say is. Um, be really, really careful with anything like this when you're using machinery. I, f- mm. I normally take the la- the lav mic off completely when I'm using things like the router table and table saw, j- yeah. just to keep the cable out the road. Um, just obviously make sure that the cable's well tucked away so there's no possibility that it can get snagged up in any machines that you're using. Um, so, yeah, mm. there you go. Fascinating. I had one other bit of uh, feedback, which is quite an interesting one. Someone said, Christopher said, love listening to you two at work in my excavator and w- wishing I could be working back in joinery, keep up the great work. And I thought, oh, well, that's really cool. And I'd love to hear where people are listening to the show, if it's somewhere interesting yeah. like that. And if people want to post, we've now set up a contact email address, contact at measuringuppodcast.com. All I would say is, if you're listening to this in in future time, I wouldn't like to guarantee how long that email address will be there for, because it depends how inundated we're getting, you know, if it turns into just a complete spam reservoir, as email can end up when you you put public email addresses out there. But contact at measuringuppodcast.com. If you want to send a couple of pictures of where you're listening the podcast, we'll put them out there on our Instagram and and Twitter and stuff. So be really interesting to see. Yeah, absolutely. Or of course through the uh podcast Twitter account, measuring up PC on the Twitter. Yeah, definitely uh, measuring up podcast on Instagram as well. So you can follow us on, on both of those. So measuring up PC on Twitter and measuring up podcast on, on Instagram. Mm, yes. As I say, contact at measuring up New email address there if you want to get in touch with the show. If you want to send us some pictures of where you are when you're listening to it, keep it clean. Yeah, that'd be great. <laughs> Fascinating. That that would be really interesting. We'll see what diverse range of uh, environments people listen to the podcast in. I think it's quite interesting. So what uh, what have you been watching and listening to this week? Um, not very much, to be honest. Um, uh, me neither, to be honest. I'm head down on grafting. I must admit, yeah, this um, week I, I've just not had I haven't had time over the last couple of weeks, other than mm. the stuff that I've already mentioned before. Um, but yeah. nothing, nothing new. Yeah, I want to give a quick shout out. You know Keith Brown, Rag and Bone Brown on YouTube. Yes, we, we've been chatting here and I a little bit over the over the last uh, few months, and he's just got a video out on his channel. He's actually got two out, uh, a sort of an Ask Me Anything type uh, uh, couple of videos, and he he's, he's asked about if he's going to go full-time as a YouTuber. And he talks a little bit about the, the costs involved uh, uh, and talks about his um, uh, uh, how much income his channel generates, which is really interesting. I, I, won't, I won't, you know, go and watch the video. There'll, there'll be a link in the show notes. But he gets 68% of his... Uh, if you don't know Keith Brown, he's one of the, the more successful British YouTubers. He's chasing down 50,000 subscribers at the minute. Um, he's been on YouTube for two to 
three, I think it's about a year ahead of me, so it's about two, two and a bit years. Um, but he gets 68% of his income from, from YouTube, from Google AdSense, 16% uh, from Patreon, 11% from sales, so stuff he makes and sells through his channel, and 5% through affiliate links, so Amazon and uh, whatever else, which I thought was fascinating. Uh, obviously, he's got a bigger bigger channel than I have, and, and so because you've got more subscribers, you get more views generally, so you you'll get more... AdSense income, um, but I I have about forty five percent from YouTube, Google AdSense, about twenty seven percent from Patreon, and about twenty nine percent from affiliate links, whether that's Amazon or Amazon dot com or eBay. That, that's um, very interesting. Amazon actually pay quite well for affiliates, and I don't understand how they make any money from it. I, 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 oh well, th that's another topic for another. Well, yeah, day. that's right. <laughs> Maybe they don't. <laughs> Um, and the other thing I've been listening to a little bit, again, this a little bit sort of left of field. This in, in terms of podcasts, it's um, and I'll, I'll say this in the British way: A sixteen Z. It is an American podcast, so they call it A sixteen Z. But it's uh, Andreessen Horowitz, uh, a venture capital firm in the Valley, in California. Um, they're, they're, a lot of what they discuss is completely over my head and all a bit inside baseball. It's a techie, nerdy kind of stuff, basically. Um, but there's a guy called Benedict Evans, who is uh, a British uh, analyst. He's a former Cambridge history graduate, and he turned into a, a mobile analyst uh, for a variety of investment banks in London and then was uh, headhunted out to go to uh, California. Uh, and also a guy called Stephen Sinofsky, who was the former head of Windows at Microsoft. He's now at A16Z. Um, uh, 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 if you get the two of them together on a podcast, they're, they're really great. But either one or the other uh, are, are always worth listening to. And in the current one, uh, the current uh, podcast, Stephen Sinofsky talks about the General Data Protection Regulation, or the GDPR. That's an EU directive, which has been sort of four years in the making. Uh, with regards to personal privacy and our right to um, to know what data is gathered about us. And given the brouhaha that Facebook finds itself embroiled in at the moment, it's quite pertinent. Uh, it comes out, uh, the GDPR uh, comes out uh, into effect uh, at the end of May, 25th of May, I think. So it's been four years in the making. So, uh, you know, I say a little bit nerdy, um, but very interesting. Because this affects all of us, because every every company, you mentioned Ironmongery Direct earlier, giving us you know many, many emails every time we've put something in our basket but not uh, not purchased yet. Uh, they'll, they'll, if you haven't had it already, anybody you have that sort of relationship with, you actually have to opt into that in future. Um, so we'll be getting lots of emails about this. Uh, and it's an interesting take on... Uh, on what it means for those businesses. So yeah, uh, as I say, uh, very interesting. If, if you're interested in that kind of thing, if not, then you know by all means, listen to something else. But uh, yeah, it, it's worth a, worth a listen because I don't know about you, Andy, but I, I find that a lot of the the techie nerdy stuff is so unrooted in my world. Uh, I'm fascinated to see how the people who make this stuff think about it. So uh, it's 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 interesting to see where they're coming from anyway. Yeah, definitely. And uh, I mean, over the last couple of weeks, one of the major tasks that I've been, and I say major task, it's been, uh, yeah, a huge job is that I'm slowly coming off Facebook. And I think I mentioned in the past, uh, I've had a little bit of a rant about it. It's not easy to extract yourself from Facebook when you've been on it for 11 years. And it's, I mean, I've got four or five business pages, five if you include the Measuring Up podcast one. Um, and so it's not as simple as just deleting your account because my account is tied into those pages and I don't want to delete the pages. So basically what I've done is I've set up another a new account that controls those pages um, so that I can... <laughs> so, so your way of distancing yourself from Facebook is by setting up another Facebook again. Okay. <laughs> It's it's like needing to get a lawyer to sue your existing lawyer, isn't it? It's, it's, it's the just, only yeah, way okay. because I was thinking, well, oh, it just turns into a huge, a huge thing. But it just seems to me it's a problem that at some point I'm going to have to sort out because I'm not comfortable with that level of personal information being out there. And I think that's really hit home over the last couple of weeks with everything that's been going on with Facebook. But it's been worrying me 
for the last couple of years anyway, mm-hmm. just about how much, and it's not until you do a full data dump of your Facebook uh, profile that you realise how much stuff is on there. You know, every single thing that you've ever posted, every message, every photograph, every person you've ever been a, friends with, everyone you've unfriended, everyone you've refused to be a friend with. Mm. All of this stuff is logged and it's in your uh, data extraction that you can do from Facebook. And it's not until you see it all, it's like, wow. And it's only going to get bigger and mm. bigger and bigger. And to me, I'd, I don't predict the demise of Facebook, but I just am not comfortable with it anymore. Um, I'm not happy about that much personal information being out there freely accessible to pretty much anyone. And I know this security stuff and all that sort of thing you can you can do, but there's a certain amount of it that, you you know, it's shared with your friends. And then once it's shared with your friends, how do you stop your friends sharing it, et cetera, et cetera, you know. Mm. Well, that's, that's network effects overall, isn't it? I, I'm not really a Facebook user. I've only, I've had an account for a couple of years, but I never, you know, my timeline consisted of people wishing me happy birthday uh, once a year and me not putting any response in because it never occurred to me to look at it. Um, I, I've only been using Facebook tangentially for six months or so. Uh, uh, and I'm a member of a couple of Facebook groups which I just regard as the modern version of forums, you know. Uh, I'm actually getting back into forums as a result of coming coming off Facebook, and it just, I feel a lot more comfortable when, I don't mind, you know, I'm not complete tinfoil hat brigade type person by a, a long stretch of the imagination. I mean, geez, I've got a lot of social media accounts. You, you, that is life behind the wheel of, of doing YouTube stuff. But eventually it does get to the point where it's like, hmm, th- this is a problem I'm going to have to sort out at some point. And the problem's only going to get bigger and bigger and bigger. Am I going to sort it now? Or is it a problem that I'm going to sort mm. 20 years down the line when the 31 years of history on Facebook that I need to go through? Now, that would be a um, big data dump, wouldn't it? That that would be. And it's like, ultimately, what are you going to do with it? You're probably going to just press delete. So it's like, well, I might sort of get rid of it now. Yeah. So. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I do have one more little pick of the week for you. Go for it. Um, uh, I don't know. You might have got the, the email as well, but we were talking about tech on the job uh, uh, in the last podcast. Um, I, I got an email <laughs> in the week called a tape player, and it's a Bluetooth-connected 8-meter tape measure, and it will control the volume of your phone or sight radio over Bluetooth. Oh, okay, okay. It's got a little... Play, pause, skip buttons on the on the actual <laughs> tape measure. I, I presume it's battery operated. I don't know if you can recharge it or if it has a little silver oxide in there or whatever. But I, you, at first, I thought that's a ridiculous thing, and I thought actually that might be really handy if you, if you want to, you know, just pause your music while you take a phone call or something. <laughs> anyway, uh, tape player. I think it was at. Uh, we'll put a link in the show notes. I think it was a Tool Stop who showed that up. Uh, but it's a surpri- surprising 40 quid that costs, uh, down from uh, the list price of 64 or something. So, yeah, you'd have to be really keen, wouldn't you? I'd, I'm intrigued. I need to have a look at that. I think someone mentioned as well that I should just upload all my music onto Google Play and stream it. But that would kind of defeat the um, object of having it locally on my phone, which lets me listen it without an internet connection, etc. So, um yeah, that wouldn't really fix my problems. I don't have a problem. But I'm quite happy having my music on my phone on Android. I have no plans to change back to Apple at this stage, but we'll see how long I can last on Android. But I've been on Android for a couple of years now, and it's not prevented me doing anything. As I say, I've got nothing against Apple. I've been on Apple before. I'm on Android now. I might go back to Apple in the future. Well, we'll the, the podcast listeners will wait with bated breath and indeed on that bombshell. We'll say thank you very much for listening. It's been a pleasure talking with you, Andy, as always. Uh, you can uh, contact us uh, through the podcast Twitter, Measuring Up PC on Twitter, uh, or indeed through the new shiny, all clean and bright email uh, address which is contact at measuring up com. yes i think that's it and thanks as always to all of our patreon supporters as well totally 
amazing the support that we've got on there thank you so much so yeah i think that's it for today where do we find you on youtube Peter? Uh, you can find me at 10 minute workshop tv will take you straight to my uh, straight to my channel uh, i'm 10 minute workshop on instagram and 10 minute shop on twitter uh, how about you andy what's your uh, what's your social and mine's gosforth handyman on youtube so you can just search for gosforth handyman and you will find me kicking about on YouTube, and you'll find everything from there. Great stuff. Very enjoyable, as per usual, Peter, massively over time. What we're going to talk about next week? Should we talk about the stuff that we're going to talk about in episode one? Yeah, probably. 